Thank you all for coming. It is my pleasure and distinct honor to welcome our presenter for the 10th annual Ongar Ulanov Memorial Lecture in Russian Literature. And I will say something about our late colleague, Dr. Ongar Ongar Ulanov, and then introduce our speaker. You all have this in your program, but it will be nice to remember him again here um, and uh, recall his contributions to the department and our field and express our gratitude to his family for endowing generously this lecture series. Professor Uwanov was one of the founding professors of the Department of Slavic and East European Languages and Literatures at the time at the Ohio State University, where he served from 63 until his retirement in 1991. He was born in Prague, Czechoslovakia, in an emigre family, and moved to Paris, where he graduated from the University of Paris with uh, a diploma in Arabic languages, language and literature. Um, and then he spent some postgraduate studies in Belgium or pursued postgraduate studies in Belgium. He uh, helped his father's efforts to better the lives of Kalmyk refugees in Western Europe who had fled Stalinist uh, persecution as a result of their petition to the Eisenhower administration, these refugees were allowed to immigrate to the United States in the 90s, 1950s. After receiving his PhD in Russian literature from Harvard University in 1960, Professor Rulanov taught at Harvard for one year and then at Vanderbilt for two years. And since 1963, he, has, he joined the department um, our department of Slavic and East European Languages and Literatures and uh, worked here until his retirement as already mentioned. He, uh, his expertise was in the Serapion brothers and Benjamin uh, Kaverin and he authored seminal works in these uh, fields. He worked with many uh, students and uh, advised dissertations and, and PhD students. So his contribution to our department, our field, and our students is really invaluable. With that, I return to our guest speaker who comes from Harvard, where Dr. Luana received his PhD. Uh, degree. Dr. Stephanie Sandler is a scholar of Russian literature with special interest in poetry and cinema. She is a professor of Slavic and currently a department chair of the department and for the latter she has my full sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> she has published numerous books, Distant Pleasures, Alexander Pushkin and the Writing of Exile, commemorating Pushkin, Russia's myth of a national poet, co-authored history of Russian literature, and co-edited or edited rereading Russian poetry, self and story in Russian history, sexuality and the body in Russian culture. She has many other awards and achievements, but I think it would be better suited just to let her and her voice speak for itself. Please, let us welcome our... Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I want to thank the Ulana family for generously making this occasion possible. I think it's really wonderful um, at colleges and universities where we have these moments to 
um, pay tribute to the professors who came before us, who made possible the departments in which we work, and helped to create the fields that we are hoping to continue with our own work. It's a very great pleasure to be here at Ohio State, where I have many friends, people that I've known, and in some cases haven't seen for a very long time, so I'm very grateful to you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm speaking about work that comes from uh, my own larger project, which is about contemporary Russian poetry. Uh, it has this title, Russia Will Be Free, and it is about recent poems by Russian women. There's a handout that you also have. Please don't be alarmed by the length of it. I will mostly just refer to what's there, although I will pause in a few occasions uh, to read some of that work because I want you to hear how some of this poetry sounds. Um, but mostly it's a little gifty to take home, and I hope that you will be moved to want to read more of the work by the remarkable women I'm about to talk about. So, about a month ago, uh, the writer Masha Gessen reported on the demonstrations and arrests that had been going on in Moscow in this past summer. She was writing for the New Yorker, and these are some images that we've seen uh, all too recently and all too strikingly. Those images are all from Moscow, but the demonstrations were in multiple places. She concluded referring to these arrests as long as the current regime exists, this number that is of arrests will grow, as will the length of prison sentences and the brutality of the enforcers. This is how freedom shrinks. Once the vector has been established, there are no turning points, only the movement of the relentless freedom-eating machine. Masha Gessen has long reported on the protests that have been launched by Russia's citizens. But at this moment, when freedom is shrinking, I want to ask why people still protest. Indeed, I want to ask how one becomes this young woman, seen in 2017 and entirely unruffled by the police escort that she has just acquired. Her placard reads, Russia will be free, and that's the source of the title of my talk today. I take that as a direct challenge to the freedom-eating machine that Masha Gessen uses to describe the current Russian state. There are other ways to protest, of course, including the dramatic form of self-mutilation practiced by Pyotr Pavlinsky. This is from 2012. The self-abusing gesture of this performance art directed against his own body challenges Russia's only apparent permission of free speech. Like the young woman seen in the arrest photo, or the thousands who hit the streets this summer, he was using his body to assert the most defiant form of free speech, one that is physical, risky, and I think to us disturbing. Many other examples of creative dramatic protests could be given, including by Russia's writers. They insist on freedom of expression and they set the example for how minds might be ever more unfettered. Their rhetorical performances are doing what Svetlana Boyne would have called co-creating the practice of freedom. And that co-creation is especially vividly seen in Russia's poetry, perhaps because poetry is the most highly energized form of literary performance. Russia's poets, especially its women poets, are sharing the pleasures and dangers of free thought by writing poems that dynamically move readers along new pathways of freedom. The Me Too movement has made its mark in Russia, and the last year has seen dramatic conflict in the community of contemporary poets some of it shockingly aggressive, and all of it surely painful to all of its participants, male and female alike. Without airing today that particular form of dirty laundry, I want to share with you some of the most striking poetic texts to emerge in this moment. Poems meant to liberate their readers, meant to create freedom, rather than lament its lack. These poems are well illuminated by a wide range of feminist theories. Indeed, they show us the enduring legacy of feminist thought. The key poets are Galina Rimbu, Aksana Vasyakina, and Lida Yusupova. And I'll conclude with a very few remarks about the poets who preceded them, chiefly Yelena Fanailova and Maria Stepanova. I start with Galina Rimbu, whose work is symptomatic of the way women poets have reclaimed a radical political voice. And my remarks about the other poets will be necessarily slightly briefer, but I hope in all cases enough to make you want to read more of their work. So here's Galina Rimbu, 
she has published five small books of poems in Russian in the last five years. For more than a decade, she's been an activist in Petersburg and Moscow. She now lives in Lviv in Ukraine, and earlier this year she began writing reports on gender and violence for the Free Russia Foundation. In her byline, she uh, describes herself as a philosopher, a poet, and a feminist, but with distinctly feminine marked words, uh, philosophinia, feministka, even poetessa, that outmoded uh, term which she renovates. She's backed away from attempts, though, to read her poetry as agitational work or as following a party line. Rhetorically, she reaches toward philosophy, and one of her models here, I think perhaps surprisingly, is Arkady Dragomoshenko. Terms like matter, form, time, organization, so materia, forma, vrenia, organizatia, are mixed into poetic lines about a grimy street or a light dappled field. Blood, fire, excrement, and sweat are as likely to appear in her poems as are textiles, plant life, or those recognizable forms of a lyric project like voice or vision or screen. The texture of her poetry is roughened, and most of her distinctive poetic and her most distinctive poetic device is repetition, used as a rhythmic device to unify the texts. She writes against forms of decay, or what she calls in one cycle decline. This is the cycle from the year called Kigo Padka. She exfoliates there the stages of ruin that corrode landscapes, bodies, buildings, concepts, and creates a poetic equivalent of the morally compromised beauty seen in a film like Andrei Zyagintsev's Leviathan. The poetic subjectivity of her work aligns her with a deeply feminist project, even when the poetic subject is unmarked by gender. It shuttles back and forth between individuality and community, between I and we. The poems can press us to ask about the experiences of hers that might have emancipated her toward this speech, and we might be tempted to simply recapitulate her biography, beginning with the childhood of economic desperation in Siberia. The poems bear datelines that trace her movements from Omsk and Ustishim to Moscow, Petersburg, and now Lviv. And they show her experiences, too, of student uprising, feminist movement, and motherhood. There's a balance between the constraints and injuries of daily life on one hand, and the refusal on the other to be undone by those harms. There's a sense of free movement across geographic space, and the, uh, the poems reflect a kind of shape-shifting identity. Many of the poems are dense with figuration, and they are very long. Her move toward longer form lets her create a great deal of space for the reader to wander through. It is a way of seeing on the move, and thus you get the phrase, the moving space of revolution, uh, as the title of one of her poems. Persons are inspected in public when, or when they are in transit, like the man in one poem from Nyefti Yugansk, who's arriving at the railroad station, or two oil and gas workers riding on a train with an unexpected container of blood by their side. The speaker herself is constantly changing subways or watching students themselves on the march. And the persons that we see, as well as the concepts, can be in motion, like that moving space of revolution. In one poem, a holiday is deemed a dialectical motion that cannot resolve itself. It unfolds in reality as a form of failure. And behind that concept is a figure of indeterminate gender who's moving between two windows. So those phrases all come from the start of that poem, Holiday, Preisnik, and it's the first one that you have on your handout. The whole poem is about three pages long. Here you see the opening. The title of the poem, Holiday, or Preisnik, is a little perplexing. The term is mentioned a few times in the poem, but by the end, the idea of a holiday has become clear as an allegory of art itself. I'm reminded of the last lines in the film, Andrei Rubyov, when Andre comforts the sobbing boy who has just cast the bell miraculously, and he says to him, what a holiday you have created for the people. Tarkovsky's film, in a way, also models her juxtaposition of the story of one individual with the story of masses of people, people who are subjected to violence uh, and suffering, people who, in the final scene, celebrate that move through history like the moving space of revolution. I'm giving you here the final lines of her poem, and this now brings us to the group who is on a holiday picnic. <laughs> 
Here, all the abstractions of the poem are brought together and rearranged. Um, in these lines, we hear a, mi a mix of abstract language and the objects of everyday life, buckets, apples, drinking, and there's a repeated lowering of stylistic level. This is a picnic on a site where oil is going to be pumped. Um, in this case, I'd actually just like to read a little bit of it so you can hear how some of the poetry sounds. Uh, so on the handout, you have the English as well as the Russian. Работа поэзии становится все более отличима, как труд, как смешение форм труда, происходящее без превосходства. Мне снится, что мы, мы никогда не узнаем, что такое письмо, доступное всем. Когда кровь станет матовой, а марта волшебной земли станет вся из плодов, овощей, фруктов, вьющих в землю, и мы будем собирать их, чтобы отнести на нефтяную вышку, где вместо качевой нефти наши друзья играют музыку и что-то пьют. Я разрежу плоды, а из них посыпаются семена значения во множестве. Предложу подруге съесть их. Она скажет, ты что, хочешь обидеть меня? Нет, вот другие яблоко и пенец, и семья возьми. The lowering of style here is literalized by references to what is beneath to the earth, to the mines, to the layers where the oil could be pumped. And that's not unlike Tarkovsky's typical camera gesture, actually, that takes us down to the ground, especially in a film like Stolker. Uh, the labor of making poetry, as the poet puts it, is the labor to make poetry accessible to all. Those italics mark the phrase as borrowed from an ideology that Rimbu might support, but whose principles she is interrogating. How to make poetry accessible to all, but still retain its mystery. It's allusion. Rimbu is also keen to lower a different barrier, one which emerges in a prior sentence, a poetry derived without supremacy, where the rejection of supremacy is a rejection of social hierarchies. She rejects the idea that the poet stands supreme, epitomized for the Russian tradition, perhaps in a canonical poem like Pushkin's Monument poem. Her revision comes in the, these final lines, where the pillar is replaced by an oil derrick, and the poetic speaker shares foodstuffs whose seeds she hopes to sow. But even that gesture is too high-minded. She humbles herself still further, looking for seedless foods, something unlike the taboo pomegranates eaten by Persephone, as if an apology. Rebu can harshly criticize, criticize assumptions about women's diminished social status, but here she refuses to leave aside the social roles and myths associating women with food and nourishment. She makes good on that refusal, cutting up fruit into variations on the theme of poetry in the making. She cedes nothing to the power of men. There's no bargain here with the male god of Hades or anywhere else. There's much more that could be said about the images in this final set of lines, about the blood with its oddly matte finish. Blood turns up in her poems more than any other material substance, reminding us of the embodied presence of all persons and things, their fragility, their insistent clinging to life. This blood of animals and wounds is spilled blood, a marker of the transgressive nature of our violent world. And in this, her poems, I think, resemble Pavlyansky's performance art. Rimbu depicts a world in which blood, what she calls black, putrid blood, is brought into obscene view. She splatters that blood across her poems as a challenge to all readers to create a world in which the wounds might be healed. So I move now to the second poet, Aksiana Vasyakina. She was a student with Galina Rimbu at the Gorky Institute, and she said that Rimbu showed her how her poems could have an emancipatory, emancipatory force. From her first book, Jenska Rosa, Women's Prose, she's allied herself with the cause of women's poetry, saying that her intended readers were women. She drew a great deal of attention in 2018 with a staggering poem on, in the, published in the online journal Kolta as one of two poems about violence, Dvastik Varinya Nasili. Here is the poem's beginning. Uh, it's a very striking poem on its own terms, but what is perhaps even more amazing is that Kolta made an exception to its own policy of not publishing poetry. Poems were taking their place as exemplary moments in Russia's free speech. Vasyakina's poem became a signal moment in Russia's own nascent Me Too, move, Me Too movement, 
which in Russian is Yani uh, uh, that's the hashtag, or I am not afraid to speak. Her poem helped to bring post-traumatic discourse out into the open, and her own acts of speaking freely have drawn further attention to her, not all of it positive. Two things about Vasyakina's poetry should be kept in mind. One has to do with sex, and the other with anger. So first, sex. Russian poetry has a very long tradition of prudery. And while there are ample predecessors for her erotic writings from the post-Soviet period, her calmness and her sense of acceptance remains unusual. I think the closest comparison is the work of Yelena Fanailova. Vasyakina writes poems of great tenderness. Some of them take up varied gender positions. There's one poem that begins, Zhenska Prosa, spoken from the position of a young boy. Uh, but the structure of lesbian desire is what is felt throughout her work. Vasyakina's lesbian love uh, lyrics are something to the, so to the poetry of Sofia Parmok. She has Parmok's distinctive mix of irony and desire. But her own lines of free verse uh, are very different from the rhymed and metered stanzas by Parmok. I think a more apt model for Vasyakina's poetic persona is Anna Barkova, a comparison that will bring us back to anger. Barkova survived long years in the gulag, and what you see before you is an arrest photo, I think one of the most defiant of arrest photos imaginable. But she began her poetic work as a strong voice for the revolution, representing herself as an incendiary, as a rebel, as a dangerous lover. Her first book of poetry was called Just the Woman, the Zhenchina, published in 1922. And it's an important predecessor for Vasyakina's Zhenska Proza. Barkova knew that strong emotions like anger and vengeance are shocking in a woman's poem. That energy fuels her 2019 text, Song of Fury, Hisnya Yavsti. In that poem, one hears echoes of the poem, the first poem that I flashed, the bits of which you have on the handout, What I Know About Violence, Shliya's Nela Nasiri. It shares the rhetorical structure of lists, the repetitions, the litany of crimes narrated in a kind of flat, journalistic voice. But what is sharper in the new poem is the sense of rage. It is an anger that readers of feminist poetry will recognize from US feminism, and particularly from the poems of the great Adrian Rich, from whom uh, Vasyakina's own point of departure, I'm going to come back to Rich in a moment, Vasyakina's own point of departure is the French feminist Monique Vitig, uh, from whom she takes the epigraph for her piecenia Yadosti. So here is that epigraph and the very start of that poem. Vitig and Rich, though, should be kept in mind because they were pioneers in lesbian feminist movement, which is, I think, an important lineage for Vasyakina's poetry. In writing about Adrienne Rich, Helen Vendler noted that the poetry of pure anger is a relatively rare phenomenon. But I think that Vesyakina's poems challenge any notion that a poetics of anger must soon spend itself. She conjures up an army of women that are familiar from Vitig's uh, 1969 novel, Les Guerrières. As you can see, she actually cites a different Vitig text for her epigraph. She creates in her poem, Vesyakina, a utopian space where women's anger matters and where the hurt that women have experienced can heal. And indeed, it is with the gesture of healing that the poem begins. That is, its first line. How does the healing actually work, though? First of all, because the unspoken is brought into language. It's brought to the surface, brought up, as Adrian Rich would have said, by diving into the wreck. But unlike Rich's diving metaphor, Vasyakina, like Rimbu, imagines horizontal movement across space, picking up and shedding armaments, wounds, new energies along the way. These are women on the move, so much so that when Yelena Fanailova read this poem, she said she had to get up, go out, go for a walk. That motion is impelled by the fury, the yadist, and by the wind that rages in the poem, it makes the metaphor of air into the oxygenating exhilaration of freedom. Here, the inhalation and exhalation of breath is as loud as the howling wind. The poet even sees the movement of oxygen uh, coming into their dreaming nostrils. It is the very wind that sings. At the end of the poem, a procession of women is imagined as touching the air on the wind. So what I've given you, again, this is a long text, 
I've tried to just pull out a kind of montage of striking images. So all of those ellipses are mine, um, and these are from different parts of the poem, although that is the last line of the poem. Air has a materiality through which bodies move in strength and in anger, a materiality that's comparable uh, to that of the earth and of the body's blood, which is rendered thick with the symbolism of wounds, of menstruation and childbirth, and it is a potent regenerative force. The final line of the poem predicts that the blood will grow up through the earth, so that is that last line, Kroth Zarasleit Kroth My second poem is a tour de force, one that insists on its own power to mix narratives of individual harm with warning, projection, and fantasy. Body parts in this poem are actually removable, exchangeable. This is a fantasy where women's bodies, mutilated and degraded, are transformed into entities beyond harm. If body parts have the capacity for renewal through amalgamation and regeneration, then Pisnia Yadasti has imagined women's bodies actually as invulnerable. They are strengthened by absorbing the very muscle tissue of the enemy, creating an invincible armor. Hardened by the assurance of comfort and the completion of their comrades, the women warriors move from a howl of despair, given as that long line of vowels, toward the power of song. It is the wind's song that they inhale into their lungs and exhale just as forcefully. Vasyakina's writing is meant then not just to heal the wounds, but to convey courage. Rather than a willingness to concede that there is no language to describe the fury, the poem rises to its replacement of drawn-out sounds that are, as she said in an interview, like the work of mourners, Tlokashiki, who channel a family sense of devastation with their kini. To those drawn-out sounds, Vasyakina adds in her own stories that refuse to go untold. Hers is a wild retort of identification and determination and rage. One wonders, as her career unfolds, this is a poet who's really just starting out, what admixtures, what alloys she will forge in the poems to come. So I turn now to a third poet, Vida Yusufova. This is a, a photograph of which she is herself extremely proud. Uh, earlier this year, when uh, Vasyakina was asked about her favorite books, she mentioned Vida Yusufova. They share important political affinities, including a belief that poems can accommodate the tales of sexual violence. Their poems include a range of voices and stylistic registers as a democratizing gesture. They assess shrewdly the harms that a culture of heterosexual privilege can inflict on sexual minorities and on women. Yet there are significant aesthetic differences here which themselves have political consequences. Yusupova is a poet who oriented her writings from the start toward pleasure, beginning with poems that evoked warm air on the skin, that spoke of lovers and paradise and joy. There's a list of her publications. But war is often sensed in the distance and death hovers and bringing, da bringing danger to this paradise. Pleasure and danger was the formulation for a sex-positive version of feminism that was advanced in the 1980s as against the radical feminism of Audrey and Rich or Catherine McKinnon. Vasyakina resembles the radical feminists, particularly in the rejection of patriarchy and of what radical feminists call compulsory heterosexuality or what VT called the heterosexual contract. But Yusupova would seem to have taken the opposite position, particularly in her book, the second one listed, it's a book of prose, VT Ruki, Love Has Four Arms, with its several configurations of erotic relationships and identities. By 2008, Yusupova was living a part of every year in Belize, hence the picture with the um, baby alligator, or whatever that creature was. Um, uh, it was for her a second dangerous paradise, and the balance then tipped from pleasure to danger. Her work crosses what were once separate strands of feminist theory. The aesthetic in some ways depends on metaphors of danger and pleasure, but also on exposure and denunciation of sexual violence with an intensity that actually feels much more like that of the radical feminists. She built these poetic texts on found documents. Historical and archival material mark her 2013 book, Ritual C4, 
and legal documents are a significant presence in her book Dead Dead. So both of these books has, have English language titles, but they are books of Russian poetry. In Yusupova's poems, the documentary impulse can yield a strangely cooler version of Vasyakina's anger. Yusupova's poems are organized around repetition, estranging us from the language on display. When violence intrudes, the poet presses herself to understand the perpetrators as well as the victims. Violence is not confined to Belize in her representation of Canada, so she lives part of each year um, actually in Canada. And she writes about Canada in the age of colonial expansion. Uh, there's a brilliant poem that opens her book, Ritual C4, about the death of Margaret Agnes Clay. It's the strongest precursor to the poems of legal verdicts in her cycle called Verdicts, Prigavori, which began in 2015 and will, I believe, be the title of the next book, um, which is uh, soon to come out, if not this year, the next. Those poems are built entirely out of juridical language splicing and repeating fixed phrases, a horrifying effect. So in the second poem of the Prigavori, the verdicts cycle, for nine of its 15 pages, the poet writes only this one phrase. So I've tried to replicate the effect of this, but what you need to imagine is this phrase at the top of a page, and a, a book, and it's a blank page after that. And you keep turning the pages, and this is what you see for 15 pages in a row. You can see why I didn't put it on your handout, which is <laughs> long enough as it is. Um, when Yusupova performs this poem, she reads this phrase, which the death of the victim, smirk petir pirshi, almost in a whisper, making it matter that one woman has perished by violent crime. So for those of you who know Russian, you know that the victim in this case is a woman. It's, a, a, it's marked as female and gender. In this instance, the murderer got a reduced sentence because of the supposedly questionable morality of the victim. Yusupova's poem hammers away at Law's judgment that her life was worthless than his. She's indicting a culture that lacks curiosity to even learn the story of the victim's life. In building her poems out of juridical language, Yusupova is following a documentary impulse that's powerful in contemporary Russian literature. So we could give the example of the awarding of the Nobel Prize to Sitmana Alexievich in 2015 uh, for, uh, to see a great example of that. In writing about uh, Alexievich, Ilya Kukulin has described her work as well as poetry as having what he calls paratactic montage. Yusupova has that kind of montage but she presents it differently from what Kukula describes. She resists interpolating her own commentary or judgment. Instead, she relies completely on formatting, rearranging, and repeating to transform legal language into poetic language. She gets great pathos from taking words which are judged by the court to be intonationally neutral and then just using them over and over again. So this is the phrase to describe the victim in one judgment, a victim who has an untraditional sexual orientation. It's a euphemism for being, not being heterosexual. The flattened language of, of euphemism here exposes what was in fact a hate crime, committed against a gay man who was lured to his death. Plain language and its repetition becomes a means to memorializing him. Uh, language, we might say, is what binds us as humans. It renders us vulnerable just as our bodies are the site of that vulnerability. Yusupova intones in English the phrase, it could have been me, in one of her short statements about poetry. And she's describing there a sense of herself standing before a poem that she's writing as if it had the mirrored surface that could show her her own face. The critic Vadim Kalinin has described Yusupova as turning a compassionate, empathic gaze to the past. And I think that's exactly right. So in the poem, Beautiful eyes, Krasivu Glaza, Yusupova seeks to understand the disturbing blog posts of a convicted murderer. She is stunned into uncertainty as she tries to imagine the world that he saw with his beautiful eyes. What does it mean to be the person who could murder and defile the body of a woman because she rejects your advances? Yusupova makes a strong case for poetry's ability to make known suffering, the way law often fails to do, 
But elsewhere in her work, she's also turned to a different kind of feminist revisionism, one that goes back to the family as the original site of patriarchy. In 2016, she published the book Dead Dad. It does, again, have this English language title, which is taken from a work of sculpture also called Dead Dad. That's what's pictured on the cover. Uh, and here is Ron Muick's sculpture, uh, which is, uh, I know, fairly alarming to look at. You, uh, Ron Muick usually works on very large scale. So here are some other examples of his work. Colossal in size. You see the gallery visitor to give you a sense of the proportion. Here's one more. But Dead Dad is shrunken in size, so I want you to imagine it's about three feet long. It's a reduced version, which I think um, makes it all the more um, horrifying. Uh, I think that Yusupova included uh, it on the cover of her book, not just for the shock value. Um, Muick's aesthetic of exaggeration and hyperrealism is a remarkably apt model for what she does in her poetry. His sculpture, whether large or small, stages the potentially overwhelming encounter with the body of another. In Dead Dad, the small figure actually magnifies the vulnerability of the corpse. Our eyes are drawn to the genitals as if we're transgressively examining the phallus of the father. Uh, Yusupova is unfazed by being in the presence of the symbolic locus of male authority. And she's engaging here with another strand of feminist theory that of French and psychoanalytically inflected feminism. The understanding that the power of the father has invaded the unconscious, that it's seeped into dreams, is taken up by other contemporary women poets. Um, I think especially Yelena Fanaelva and to some extent Galina Rimbaud. But Yusupova has a further debt to the principles of French feminism because she's found a way to palpably demonstrate that poetry by women can take up as, can do what Luce Irigare called playing with mimesis her replication and distortion of the discourse of the law in the Prigavori, this uh, verdict's poems, is like her turn then to Ron Muick's sculpture, challenging what Irigaray after Lacan calls the law of the father. So Yusupova challenges that law of the father in an unusual way. Uh, she denounces the father's legacy, even as she ironically asks whether she can get rid of its burdens entirely. So, uh, in one passage from the poem, she writes that Ron Muick, so I should say the poem talks about the death of her father, in, in part, and I've really chosen the part about Muick because I think this is a, a kind of unlocking of the poem, a way to understand this larger project. But she writes here that Muick gave his own hair to the dead dad, uh, which some critics found scandalous. And she compares that hair to the Chernobyl spider web that she saw pictured in the New York Times. So I'll read these lines uh, as well. Ron Muick dal New York from Opaki, Sveiva of Volsi, Pakosha na Chernobyl School Pavutin of New York Times. Mai Volsi dal Mini Papa, Chernobyl Spear Pauki, Pitu Jazzle Pavutin, Ron Muick dal Volsi, New York from Opaki, New York for Papa dal Volsi Mania. So in this passage, you see what seems to stare at her own hair. It is disturbingly like her father's hair. And the similarity is an effect of damaged genes, like that damaged spider web in Chernobyl. So here is the image that appeared in the New York Times, uh, an image of a spider web, whose disorder is caused, of course, by the radiation damage that occurred in the Chernobyl nuclear zone. Yusupova has made of her own dead father a similar aberration of nature. The monstrous element isn't just that he's dead, or that she was long estranged from him, both of which are mentioned in the poem. But the poem isn't just about her father. The symbolic power of the father is itself turned into a metaphor of inheritance. Pa patriarchy can only transmit damaged components. And like all irradiated objects, the contamination threatens all that it touches. The poet fearfully asks if her own biological existence continues the effects of his damaging genetic configuration. At that moment, Yusupov is asking fundamental ethical questions. Denunciation of the harms committed by others is not enough, she suggests. Each of us must ask what we have inherited, what our own legacy might be. She is reaching beyond politics or law toward a realm of good versus evil. 
uh, she presents a moral reckoning where only the language of poetry stands at the ready. So a few last words. My plan, you can tell because I keep mentioning her, my plan had been to end with the poetry of Yelena Fanailova. And here you see her with her microphone. She is a journalist for Svoboda News in Moscow, as well as a, uh, a poet, a poet whose work, I think, has enabled uh, and inspired that of Rimbu Vasyatuna and Yusupova. Here is a list of her work. Uh, give you a sense of what she has published, at least in book form. One of her great achievements is, a cre is the creation of a radically democratic and empathic poetics, one based on conversation and connection across seemingly unbridgeable differences. She has drawn on her own experiences as a medical professor, so she was a doctor in Varonish before she moved to Moscow and began to work as a journalist. And a journalist as well to tell stories of Russia in its age of transition, from the Soviet mentality in which she grew up through the chaos of the 1990s. Few poets have written as powerfully or with such astonishing and gentle hilarity about sex. And here I have in mind her poem, Liena and Liena. Or about the way that women readers perceive women poets. That in her poem, Liena and the People, Liena i Ljudi. She has herself written about Vasyakina and Rimbo and about many other poets besides. So in a way, her work is really where I might have started. But I wanted to end with Fanailova because for several years now she's been writing a massive, sprawling set of poems about the hybrid war in Ukraine. She's followed her journalist instinct to use poetry as a way to absorb and respond to current events. There's a sense that these poems have open borders. They are long and short pieces that interrelate and that can have the same hashtags when she posts them to Facebook. They enable a kind of open-ended conversation with readers, a way of establishing poems as real-time reactions to unfolding events and as gathering points for reflections on the recent past. It's as if she's sending out bits of new work when they're ready to a community of readers that include many people whom she tags for the poems and she wants them to read them, but others whom she has no way of knowing. The poems typically elicit, elicit many comments on Facebook, some simple notes of gratitude and approval, others asking questions, offering interpretations. The poems generate, in other words, more conversation. Facebook, for all of its problems, and this was true of LiveJournal before, that's the platform that the same community was using before they turned to Facebook, has become a platform that lets poets send their work directly to those who are known to want it, to need it. Rimbu, Vasyakina, Yusupova also post their new poems there as well. This is also true of one more poet I will briefly mention, Maria Stepanova. She is a prolific poet. So look at that list of books. And again, that's just the books. She is a public intellectual like Fanailova, with a stature that is not often granted to women in Russia. She is, in fact, the publisher of Kulta, the online journal where the two poems about violence were published. Um, and last month, she published a poem uh, on Facebook. So she shared, I guess we should say, on Facebook, a poem called Girls Undressed. It's a long, generous, compulsively readable, but completely unnerving poem. Here is its beginning. There are 15 of these 10-line stanzas. Like Rimbuva, Syakina, Yusupova, and Fanailova, she's using a big form, uh, building it on repetition to get across a big idea, that poetry can be a site for making public the obstacles to women's freedom, and that Russia's women poets have the power to overcome those obstacles. Stepanova's own power is not to be underestimated. As I mentioned, she's the publisher of Kolta. Uh, and she and Kulta is a site of many provocative interviews, reviews, discussions about poetry, politics, culture, and a great deal else. She is by many accounts one of the great poets writing in Russian at the current moment, a shrewd critic, a prize-winning author of prose. In this, she brings her considerable talents to bear in this poem on the topic of violence not against women, but girls. One point the poem is trying to make is the ungraspable, unspeakable nature of a world 
in which girls are treated like trees. Their bodies like a tree trunk, their limbs splayed out. They are there for the relentless gaze and command of the other. So I end with Fanella and Stepanova to show how the poetry of feminist outrage has come back to the generation of women poets who blazed the trails that are now being pursued by Yusupova, Rimbul, Vasyakina, and others. For all of these women, every metaphor for silencing is itself an assertion that the silence is over. All of these women poets, in other words, will have their say on the violence and the falsehoods that their culture is perpetrating. This is a chorus of women's voices that do not just proclaim that Russia will be free, but they show that now, in public, in full view of an authoritarian state, women are free, and they are ready for men to follow them. Thank you.